Well, uh, th thank you, Cal, for that uh, very nice uh, introduction. And first, let me ask, can everyone hear me all right? Yeah, you because know, if there's any kind of problem and you can't hear me, just don't uh, hesitate to shout out and, and uh, say that there's a, uh, a little problem. Well, first let me uh, thank the Hagen History Center and its director, Cal Pfeiffer, for inviting me to uh, give this talk. I um, want to thank several other people as well who've assisted me in various ways in regard to this talk, especially Jan Novi, uh, Pat Mahoney, and uh, Jeff Kidder. And we're also, we're lucky um, to have uh, with us here Bill Schwartz, who actually worked in the San Francisco office when, when it was still in San Francisco, and who will join us, I believe, uh, for the Q&A period after, uh, after the talk. Well, when, um, when I wrote my book on uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's works in the uh, San Francisco area, I included a section on the, uh, the office that he created there, and um, I told a story of what happened to it after Wright's death. I mentioned um, that at that time, when I, when I wrote my book about it about eight years ago, the office was disassembled and in storage in Buffalo. <coughs> and, um, and I expressed a wish that someday it uh, could be brought back to San Francisco and installed there. Other Frank Lloyd Wright admirers uh, in San Francisco had also talked about uh, bringing it back to the city and had made efforts over the years to, uh, to do this, but all of our attempts were unsuccessful. Therefore, I must admit that it's been a bit painful for me to have to acknowledge that Erie, Pennsylvania has accomplished what my own city of San Francisco has, was unable to do. But rather than get too uh, disappointed about it, I've tried to see the bright side of things, that the office has now finally been given a new life that its installation here in Erie has been done in such an excellent way and that I now have been able to see it in person thanks to this uh, invitation to visit Erie and to give this talk. So, congratulations, Erie, Pennsylvania. <laughs> and, and congratulations to the, uh, the Hagen uh, History Center. Well, here's what we'll be uh, covering in this talk. I'll explain why Wright opened a branch office in San Francisco and uh, describe his design for it, and how he used the office along with his associate, Aaron Green. And then what eventually happened to it as it traveled from one place to another and finally came to uh, Erie. But first, um, let me say something about why Frank Lloyd Wright and his architecture are important, at least in my opinion, and worthy of our attention, which may help us understand the, the office in, in certain ways, I think. Right, can you see the slides all right? Because you know, I, I should mention that I thought the, um, the hall here was gonna be darker than this, so that the slides could be seen more clearly. I don't know whether, the, whether some of these lights, yeah, if the lights can be brought down, I think you're going to be able to see the slides better. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah I just, it just occurred to me. Um, Wright is um, probably best known for his dramatic and unprecedented buildings, such as Falling Water uh, in um, the Kaufman House in western Pennsylvania of the 1930s, or the, uh, the Guggenheim Museum in New York of the 1950s. And he was constantly coming up with extraordinary designs. Another example is his plan for an amazing bridge over the San Francisco Bay, well, what he called the Butterfly Bridge, for which he uh, built a model which, as you may know, is currently on display here in Erie at the, um, the Hagen History Center. But for Wright, all of his designs and buildings, whether they were grand uh, uh, buildings or, or modest ones, embodied certain basic principles for which he collectively used the term organic. These concepts were described in various ways by, by Wright and also by Aaron Green, 
who wrote an essay called um, Organic Architecture in which he talked about some of these principles. And I'll just mention uh, uh, two or three of them. Quote, um, architecture should emerge from a consonance with nature and from patterns of structures in nature. Also, the harmonious relationship of a building to its site and to its materials and the use of unit systems of design. But, um, but I'd like to uh, suggest some more specific traits going back to Wright's creation of what he called the Prairie House of about 1900. Here are two of these houses in the Chicago area where Wright was, um, where Wright had his practice uh, at that time. The, uh, it's the, they're the Willits House and the Coonley House, which are among the more lavish uh, examples of them. Others were much more modest. And we can get a sense of how radical Wright's work was if we compare these houses with examples of two very different types of uh, American houses of about this time. Um, there, were, there were many different things going on in architecture at this time, of course, but this represents just two of them in the, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. For one thing, Wright wanted to do away with all the borrowings from European traditions and create a new American architecture, and he talked about this a lot, that this was an American architecture, with simple lines and no ornament taken from the past and a horizontality that echoes the um, natural environment. <coughs> Excuse me. And keeps the inhabitants of the buildings close to, their, um, to, close to the landscape. Also, he wanted this new American architecture to express a less formal lifestyle. So instead of the separate closed off rooms of the um, typical Victorian house, you can think of the, the parlor, for example, he, uh, he created much more open floor plans and interiors with flowing spaces, both two-dimensionally and three-dimensionally. And here we see a view of uh, Taliesin, Wright's own home and studio in Wisconsin. And also a sense of space extending from inside to outside to connect with nature, another view of um, Taliesin. Later in the, um, in the 1930s, Wright transformed his prairie house into a simpler and less expensive type of, uh, of dwelling, what he called the Usonian house. Usonian was his um, um, adjective for U.S. or the United States. And here we see the, uh, the Jacobs house, one of the first of these, in Madison, Wisconsin. And these, um, these Usonian uh, designs had a huge influence on American suburban architecture. Another of Wright's uh, innovations beginning in the uh, 1920s and 30s was architecture based on non-rectangular geometry, triangles, hexagons, circles, and so forth, which created um, even more fluidity and a uh, sense of dynamic spaces. This happens to be the Hannah House at Stanford University, um, uh, which Kyle referred to, uh, and uh, that I was involved in after the um, earthquake of 1989, which has a, and this Hannah House has a um, plan based completely on hexagons. Well, there's much more that we could say about Wright's innovations and his uh, principles. But let's turn now to San Francisco and his office there. Wright had been um, designing buildings for San Francisco from relatively early in his career. For example, his first design for a, um, for a skyscraper uh, was for downtown San Francisco in 1913. And even though it was not built, it was one of his uh, favorite designs, and he kept a large model of it behind his uh, drafting table, as you can see in this um, slide. And then in the, the late 1940s, he began receiving a lot of commissions for uh, buildings in San Francisco and, and the surrounding uh, Bay Area. And here's a map of the Bay Area. Actually, it's, uh, I've advanced to that slide already, so you see it on the right there. And each of the numbers here on this map, you can't see the numbers, but there are a lot of them, uh, are uh, refer to one of uh, Wright's designs. Only some of these, and there are almost 30 of them, uh, only some of these designs were built, mostly houses, but some other types of buildings too. For example, 
the V.C. Morris gift shop. Wait a minute. Oh, oh no, they, there's the map. I'm sorry, I thought we were already looking at that. There's the map of, uh, of the Bay Area with these uh, numbers of Wright's um, designs. Um, and, uh, but there were other types of buildings besides houses that were built, uh, such as the V.C. Morris gift shop, um, which is just off Union Square in downtown San Francisco. Wright got the uh, commission for it just as he was working on the design for the, um, the Guggenheim Museum. And I think he was clearly trying out here the idea of a spiral ramp, but on a much smaller scale, of course, than, uh, than the Guggenheim. It's kind of, really, it's a kind of miniature version of the, of the Guggenheim, at least inside. Uh, <clears throat> and it was about this time that Wright started thinking about opening a branch office uh, in San Francisco to make it easier to handle the uh, work that he was getting in the Bay Area. And this is when Aaron Green enters the picture. Green had been one of Wright's students or apprentices right before the Second World War. And here on the left, we see a photo of him and Wright in 1940 at uh, Taliesin. Uh, when he was just a, a student or apprentice there. Now, on the right is a, uh, is a later photo of the two of them. Green served in, in the Air Force in the war, and uh, afterwards he worked as an architect in um, Los Angeles. Then in uh, early 1951, he happened to be traveling through Arizona, and he stopped to see uh, Wright and, and Wright's wife at the um, at Taliesin West, which was Wright's winter headquarters, and uh, here we see a, a, a photo of Taliesin West. And Green later described what, um, what happened. He said, I went out to Taliesin West and had lunch with the Wrights. As I was leaving, I told Mr. Wright I had decided to move my office to San Francisco. And he said, well, I'm glad to hear that, because I've got quite a bit of work there that needs taking care of better than it is. Why don't we jointly open an office? Uh, Green uh, said that, later said that the uh, proposal was so unexpected that he nearly fainted. But he, of course, was absolutely delighted, and he immediately started working on the uh, project. In San Francisco, he looked for a location for the office, and he found a, a, a suitable vacant space in a building on Grant Avenue in, um, in downtown. And the next time uh, Wright visited the city, he went there with Green and, um, and agreed to um, uh, rent the second floor of the building. And let me show you where this was. Here we see um, on the left an aerial view of, um, uh, of San Francisco. At the uh, top is the uh, Golden Gate Bridge uh, uh, going to uh, Marin County. And, um, and on the right, a map of, of part of downtown San Francisco, the, um, the area that's indicated uh, by the blue rectangle in the, in the aerial photo on the left. And on this map, uh, uh, there's some numbers I hope you can see. Number one on the map is the location of the office on Grant Avenue, just a block from the um, entrance to Chinatown. And um, that's the area with the uh, outlined in the dotted red line on this particular map that I, that I happen to use. Number two on the map, is the location of that of the V.C. Morris shop, that, that building that we saw um, that's on um, a narrow street called uh, Maiden Lane. And number three is the St. Francis Hotel on the other side of Union Square, which was Wright's favorite place to stay when he came to, um, to the city. So the office was very well located. Um, uh, for the rest of his life, when, uh, when Wright uh, uh, came to San Francisco, he stayed at the St. Francis Hotel and usually walked uh, to the uh, Grant Avenue office through going through Union Square on the way and stopping by the uh, Morris Gift Shop, which was one of his favorite buildings. So he always wanted to go in and, and go, go see this building of his. And there, the story is that uh, in the shop, he would often rearrange the merchandise which is kind of typical of Frank Lloyd Wright, actually. Um, he liked everything to be exactly the way, you know, the way he thought it should look. So he would rearrange the merchandise, and the owners, Mr. and Mrs. Morris, 
who had become good friends of his, made no objections at all, but after he left, they put everything back exactly the way it had been. And, um, and here is the building that the office was in, on the left there. <coughs> on the second floor of the building, and there's a red arrow there that, that points out the floor that, um, that, it's, um, that the office was on. And on the right, we see a photograph of, of, um, of Grant Avenue several blocks up in, in Chinatown, just to show that the uh, that Frank Lloyd Wright's office was close to a pretty exotic uh, area, which I think appealed to, to him. And he loved Ch uh, Chinatown. He loved going there and, and especially buying things in shops in, in Chinatown. Well, as soon as Wright rented the second floor of this building, he came up with a design uh, for, for the office and described it to Green. Green drew it up and sent the plan to, um, to Wright. And here we see the floor plan that, that Green sent to uh, Wright uh, with the, the uh, outline of the, the w walls of, of the office on the second floor as Wright had described it to him. Then Wright made a number of revisions and notes on the plan and returned it to Green. And we have all these plans. So here's, here's the, uh, drawing, the plan that, um, that Wright sent back to Green with all of his uh, uh, notes and um, and certain revisions of the uh, design. It was an ingenious design in a number of ways, and so let me describe it. And I'm going to just focus, uh, zero in more on, the, uh, on the, the floor plan itself, which we see here. And I've added numbers to this plan for the three main spaces in the office. Number one is the drafting room at the front where the uh, windows are looking out onto to Grand Avenue. Number two, is a reception area uh, where in which people would enter from the, the stairway, and the stairway is on the, um, on the right side there. And then number three, at the uh, back of the office, is, is a private office uh, where uh, Wright or Green would confer with clients. Well, rather than have three separate rooms for these three functions, Wright, and I think this is certainly typical of his work, wanted to create a more fluid sequence of spaces rather than having three closed off uh, rooms, kind of going back to some of those points I made about Wright's uh, work in general. And he also wanted to bring natural light into all of these uh, spaces, including the private office at the back, even though the, the windows were only at the, uh, at the front. So it was a challenging design problem. And he designed an unusual type of wall, um, which may be hard to see here, but uh, it's um, a, a wall consisting of translucent glass panels separated by angled redwood slats or, or louvers, which would admit light into the uh, back spaces and yet provide um, visual privacy and uh, some uh, sound insulation as well for these, for these different areas. One of these walls separated the uh, drafting room from the uh, private office, as, as you can see at the, at the back there, uh, and another wall between the uh, drafting room and the reception area was turned at a 60 degree angle, as, as you can see, creating more dynamic uh, uh, spaces on either side and reflecting those unusual geometries that uh, Wright was using in many of his buildings, such as the, um, the hexagonal geometry of the, uh, of the Hannah House that we saw uh, earlier. But the actual uh, construction of the walls, as well as uh, the built-in furniture and all the other components of the office, was done by uh, Aaron Green himself, with uh, some help from another former Talius and apprentice, a man named uh, Paul Bradley. And in one of uh, his written reports to Wright, Green said the following, we find a very cooperative spirit everywhere we go to get materials and arrange for things, in other words, for the building of the, uh, these walls and the office. Most everything we've purchased has been at wholesale or with a good discount, purely on the basis that this is your office. Green also reported that he was buying some decorative objects from several um, antique shops in Chinatown. And he, he knew that Wright himself often did this uh, kind of shopping when he was uh, in San Francisco, as I suggested earlier, and that uh, Wright considered Asian art objects to be more compatible with his architecture than most uh, Western art. 
So when you visit the office, you'll see a number of these uh, uh, Asian um, decorative uh, objects. Well, the office was, um, was already getting local attention, even it was, as it was uh, being constructed. The city's most popular journalist, Herb Kane, wrote in one of his columns in the San Francisco Examiner, quote, Frank Lloyd Wright, the most noted U.S. architect, is about to open his first branch office, and it'll be here in SF on Grand Avenue because he loves our town. But it's true that, um, that Wright did genuinely like San Francisco, as seen in his uh, letters and uh, interviews. On one of his visits, he said, San Francisco is the most charming city in America, the most cosmo cosmopolitan and the most picturesque. But um, he didn't think too much of the architecture in, in San Francisco. At one point he said, uh, it's time you had another earthquake here. <laughs> well, there are almost no photographs of the office during this period when Wright was still alive. But there are several that show Wright himself in the office. And here we see two of them. On the left we see him sitting next to part of the model of his uh, butterfly bridge uh, design, which as I said is here now in, in, in Erie at the Hagen History Center. So, um, uh, so since we don't have photographs of the office uh, when it was in San Francisco uh, during Wright's time there, um, I'm going to show now uh, uh, some views of the office as it's been reconstructed here in, uh, in, in Erie. Here's the, um, here's the drafting uh, room and uh, below the uh, reception area on the other side of that wall that's positioned at a 60 or 120 degree angle that you saw on the plan. And here's the, um, uh, the private office at the uh, top there and at the lower right a view from the, the reception area into the passageway leading to the office. And I think we, we can see here several of the distinctive traits of, uh, of Wright's architecture, such as the use of varying ceiling heights and differently shaped spaces and different light levels to create a variety ex of experiences. All of this was typical of Wright. For example, as we, as we move into the narrow passageway uh, on the uh, lower right there, um, uh, uh, with its lower ceiling and, and darker uh, light level, we may feel just a bit confined. But then we have a, a kind of liberated sense as we either go into the private office with its uh, light coming from the ceiling, or when we go back into the uh, reception area and the drafting room with their much higher ceilings. This is a really qu quintessential right, I think, with things that we would experience in much more complex ways in his actual buildings, but are achieved even in this uh, relatively small uh, office. So in this sense, I think this can really be seen as a very distinctively Frank Lloyd Wright uh, design, just this office itself. Also, typical of Wright's designs is the furniture in the office, the built-in desks, the uh, drafting tables, and the, and the stools, which are of different geometric shapes. Some are circular, square, and different. There are various shapes. And, um, and let me describe how the office was used from the time it was completed in uh, late 1951 until Wright's death in uh, 59. Green would uh, meet uh, there with clients and potential clients and use it as um, the base of operation, operations for the construction of the uh, buildings that were being executed in the uh, Bay Area. When Wright was in town, as he often was, he would confer with, with clients in the, in the office and hold press conferences and other uh, events there. A lot of uh, new commissions did come to the office, though Herb Kane was probably exaggerating when he said uh, the following in one of his columns in 1953, quote, golly, there must be a lot of rich people in our town. Last Friday, architect Frank Lloyd Wright's office here was so crowded with localites who want him to design a house for them that it looked like the $2 show window at Tan Ferran. 
Now, Tan Foran was a race course south of uh, San Francisco. And, and this is still, and then uh, uh, Herb Cain goes on. And Mr. Wright, frankly, comes high. Actually, that wasn't quite true. Um, Wright's fees were more or less standard, but it is true that, the, that his buildings did sometimes cost uh, quite a lot to construct, mainly because the designs were so unusual and sometimes it was very hard to, to make estimates of uh, building uh, costs. And, but to give an, an idea of how much work passed through the office, let me show a sampling of the Bay Area buildings or projects that were designed and or constructed in this period when uh, the office was being used during Wright's lifetime. All of these projects would be interesting to talk about, but there are just too many of them. Here are some more. Um, I, and I'm showing them just to suggest how much of Wright's work in the last decade of his life was dealt with in one way or another in this office. When Wright died in um, 1959, he and Green had just about finished up the design of another project, actually Wright's most uh, extensive project, the uh, Marin County Civic Center, consisting of a long administration building in uh, two sections connected by a domed uh, structure. You can see that in the drawing at the top here. The two um, sections positioned between uh, three hills and there were going to be subsidiary structures and a fair pavilion and recreational facilities, some of which uh, were not constructed, but the main administration building uh, definitely was. Green took on the responsibility after Wright's death of overseeing the completion of the, of the design and uh, supervision of the construction, which took several years. And uh, here we see uh, photos of the, um, of the completed uh, uh, buildings. Um, <clears throat> so the, um, the office continued to be used for work on Frank Lloyd Wright's projects after his death, mainly this um, Marin County project, but also some smaller ones that were still being worked on. Then Green began building up his own architectural practice, which grew to the point that he expanded the office into the upper part of, uh, of this Grand Avenue building, but he kept the second floor almost exactly as it had been when Wright was uh, alive and using it. And there are some photos showing it during this period after uh, Wright's death. And here we see some of these. At the uh, lower left, you see uh, Aaron Green at one of the uh, drafting tables. And uh, on the right, we see views of a um, Chinese New Year's party they had in the office in 1965. It was said to be a, a very enjoyable place to work. An acquaintance of, of Aaron Green's later recalled, quote, the office was a delightful working environment and doubly delightful by candlelight after work when Green would enjoy a drink with friends. And um, it just occurred to me it might be nice to do that here at the, uh, at the reconstruction at the Hagen History Center sometime to have uh, uh, drinks in the evening in candlelight. I don't know whether that's, maybe I'm uh, uh, being presumptuous in suggesting that. At any rate, in 1988, Green was forced, uh, unfortunately, to move out of the building. And when it came under a series of new, uh, when it came under a series of new um, owners and the rents were greatly increased, realizing that the um, office designed by Wright had to be preserved, Green decided to dismantle all the parts of it in such a way that it could uh, later be reconstructed. And thus began the unusual odyssey of uh, this office as it moved from one place to another, perhaps the most uh, unusual aspect of the, of the whole story about it. But before uh, getting to this story, I, let me just make one uh, brief digression about the building the office was in. Following Aaron Green's departure in 1988, it was used for several different commercial uh, businesses. And about 10 years ago, when I was writing my book, the building was being occupied um, uh, or used as, uh, as a rather, uh, by a rather flashy emporium of decorative objects. And we see that uh, the building as it looked at uh, that time about 10 years ago. 
Um, one day, I went into the building and asked the manager if I could go up to the second floor. <clears throat> I, um, I wanted to see what the, um, the whole second floor space was like, the, the space in which Wright had created the office. But when I got up there, I discovered that it was just a bit difficult to see or to photograph. So I could not get an idea of the overall space. <laughs> But, uh, but I did notice one interesting thing, that a lot of light flooded into the uh, second floor from the large windows on the, on the Grant Avenue side where the, where the drafting tables had been. And I think this must have been one of the reasons that Wright liked this uh, space and decided to put the office there. Well, to get back to the story of what happened to the office, when, um, when Aaron Green decided to dismantle it, he engaged another former Taliesin apprentice, a man named uh, Walter Medeiros, to carry this uh, out. First, Medeiros did very careful and detailed measured drawings of all the components of the, of the office. And here we see uh, one of these sheets. There were five, of, uh, five sheets of drawings, and this is uh, one of them, which uh, show all of the construction details necessary for uh, putting it back together, and they were hoping that this would happen at some point, for, for rebuilding it. And then all of the parts of the office were carefully disassembled and labeled and put in especially made crates, um, large, uh, many of them of course having to be large crates. Um, by the way, uh, one item was removed and put in a crate that was not technically part of the office, which was the front door which uh, was actually part of the, uh, of the building itself. And uh, here we see it in uh, a crate. This is uh, later in one of the later uh, uh, moves of, the, of all of these um, uh, parts. But here we is in, in a crate, this uh, uh, front door. Medeiros uh, and, and Green, I think, wanted to save it mainly because it had on both sides of the door, at the, at the top of the door, two examples of the initialed red tiles that Wright often put on his most important or his favorite buildings. And here, uh, you can't see it too well, but at the, at the top of the door, you might just get a bit of a sense that there's a red tile up there in the corner, and they're on both sides of, of the door. And he, but here we see uh, one of these uh, uh, red tiles. This is one that's on the uh, Hannah House at, uh, at Stanford. These tiles, by the way, had been made by by Aaron Green's mother-in-law, Jeanette Haber, who was a ceramicist. And before the, um, the clay was, was glazed and fired, it was Aaron, Aaron Green, who inscribed Wright's initials individually into each tile. So each one is unique. They're not uh, cast with the, um, with, uh, the um, initials, Frank Lloyd Wright initials, in the tile. They were, they were um, inscribed in, in each tile separately by Aaron Green. The letters F L L W, which is the way Wright liked to uh, write his uh, initials. So this is another distinctive thing I think about the the office that uh, you have here in Erie that it has two of these red tiles uh, there on, as I said, uh, Wright's uh, uh, favorite uh, buildings and some of his specially designated buildings have these red tiles, but most of these buildings have only one tile. So you have two here in Erie. Anyway, arrangements had been made by uh, Green to sell the office to the businessman Thomas Monahan in, in Michigan. Monahan, whose fortune came from the creation of the Domino's Pizza Company, had several collecting passions, for example, for vintage automobiles, but especially for anything connected with Frank Lloyd Wright. Over the years, he uh, assembled a large collection of Wright material drawings, documents, furniture, and uh, decorative objects from uh, Wright's houses. And here we see uh, uh, some of these uh, parts of this collection of his. And he uh, created what he called a center for the study of Frank Lloyd Wright in his large Wright-inspired building, uh, business headquarters outside of, um, of Ann Arbor, Michigan, which you see at the bottom here. Monahan intended to reconstruct the San Francisco office in his uh, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, center here, 
But shortly after acquiring it, his uh, priorities were uh, redirected. It's kind of a long story. And in um, 1992, the office was sold again, this time to the Carnegie Museum of Art in Pittsburgh to be reconstructed in the newly created Heinz Architectural Center in the um, Carnegie Museum. Walter Medeiros, who had disassembled the office in San Francisco, was now engaged for the task of uh, reassembling it. So the office could now be seen by the uh, public for the first time, and let's see some photos of it as it was reconstructed in, um, in Pittsburgh. Here's the uh, drafting room with the uh, louvered uh, redwood wall on the, on the left, separating it from the uh, private office, and the other wall uh, in, the, in the back, as you can see, that separates it from that uh, reception area, that wall that's at an angle. And here we see these two other uh, areas, the um, private office and the reception area. I should mention, however, that the general public could see uh, the office in this uh, reconstruction in Pittsburgh, could see it only from the outside through the windows from one of the corridors in the museum. And there, there we see it. There's that, the corridor in the Carnegie Museum. And you looked through the windows um, uh, into, the, uh, into, the, um, into the office. <coughs> well, this um, installation was uh, in place in Pittsburgh for only about six years. In um, 1999, the Carnegie Museum decided to deaccession the office. That's the, uh, the polite word, uh, term that museums use for getting rid of things from their collections. So um, in early 2000, it was dismantled again and put in crates, and they were shipped to, um, to Maryland and stored in a warehouse near the Baltimore or Washington airport. And I haven't yet been able to find out why they were sent all the way down to, uh, to Maryland, but that's another little detour in this uh, amazing story of, the, of this office that moved around from one part of the country to another. The, um, the office was consigned to Sotheby's in New York, which included it in one of its uh, auctions in June of uh, 2004, with an estimated sale price of 250 to um, $400,000. This was actually a, this was a reasonable amount because even single pieces of right designed furniture were by, by this time selling for very high prices. For example, Tom Monahan, uh, for his Frank Lloyd Wright collection, had reportedly paid over a million dollars for a dining room table and chairs from one of Wright's early houses. But despite this, the office did not sell for some reason in this uh, Sotheby's uh, uh, auction. However, a private sale was arranged following the auction to James Sandoro of, uh, of Buffalo. Pandoro was another passionate collector of, um, of vintage um, automobiles, but on a really big scale. He has one of the largest uh, collections anywhere of historic vehicles and, and related material, I believe. He um, had created the Buffalo Transportation Museum, which some of you uh, may be familiar with, and was planning to include in it a full-scale construction of an unbuilt uh, a project, an unbuilt design by Frank Lloyd Wright from 1928 for an unusual filling station. And uh, here it is as it uh, was uh, reconstructed in, um, or, or built for the first time, because this was an unbuilt design by Wright um, from 1928 for this uh, gas station or filling station. And it was uh, finally built in, uh, by Sandoro in uh, 2014 in the center of the main space of his uh, transportation museum. And here we see a, a couple of views of it on the, on the right and at the lower left, um, one of Wright's drawings of the design of this uh, gas station. Well, Pat Mahoney, an architect and uh, architectural historian who's based in Buffalo, was working with Sandoro on this uh, filling station project. And when the San Francisco office became uh, available, at the time of the uh, Sotheby's auction, it was Mahoney who got Sandoro interested in it. 
with the um, idea of installing it in his uh, transportation museum. They were also thinking of trying to acquire the um, butterfly bridge model, which I guess would have given it uh, uh, more of a transportation uh, connection. So the, um, the crates were shipped from Maryland to Buffalo and stored there. At one point, some of the crates were opened and several of the items were displayed. And here we see a photo of this. Uh, and included in this uh, display were uh, one of the drafting tables, several of the stools, and the door into the office, which is barely visible, but maybe you can see it in the back there. And they were all displayed in front of a large uh, blown up photograph of the installation uh, in, in Pittsburgh. Jim Sandoro was planning to, um, to reconstruct the office on a second floor of his uh, transportation museum, but when this uh, filling station was uh, finally built, its height prevented the uh, second floor from being constructed and the office was never actually installed in uh, Buffalo. And this is when, finally, the story takes us to Erie and to Thomas Hagen and the Hagen History Center. Tom Hagen has explained to me how it happened that he brought the uh, uh, San Francisco office to Erie. He had always been interested in architecture and over the course of his career uh, with the uh, Erie uh, Insurance Exchange, he worked with uh, prominent architects and he became intrigued with uh, the buildings of Frank Lloyd Wright, especially after visits to the uh, Darwin Martin House in Buffalo, the great uh, complex of uh, the Darwin Mountain complex in Buffalo and uh, visits to uh, Falling Water. Jim Sandoro is a good friend of Tom Hagen's, and that's how Tom came to know about the San Francisco office. At one point, uh, Sandoro described to him a vision he had of a kind of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright pilgrimage route from Buffalo to Falling Water, where Erie could play a pivotal role if it had the San Francisco office. Tom Hagen liked the idea and began working on the project, acquiring the, uh, the office in 2017 and starting uh, construction of a new building to uh, house it on the uh, Hagen History Center uh, campus. And that uh, blue arrow there points down to the, the building that was created for, uh, for the, um, uh, the office to be in. The architect Jeff Kidder, who has a specialty in um, architectural restoration, was engaged for the project and began working on the, the problem of how best to install the office. Here, by the way, are the, uh, the, the shipping crates uh, where, where all the different parts of the, um, um, or, uh, uh, of the office were, were stored during this period. One um, key decision was that the office should not be seen by visitors only from the outside as, as it had been in uh, Pittsburgh but that visitors should be able to enter the office through the original door and to circulate through it. The, ori the original space in which the office had been, that uh, second floor space in, of the Grand Avenue uh, building in San Francisco, was accurately reproduced um, uh, here in, uh, in, in Erie. Its uh, wall uh, configurations and, and the ceiling structure and, um, and the louvered redwood walls of the office were uncrated and began to be reassembled. To reconstruct the office faithfully, Jeff Kidder relied mostly on uh, those sheets of detailed drawings that uh, Walter Medeiros had produced when the office was dismantled in uh, 1988. And here we see all five of these uh, sheets of, uh, of drawings, and they are actually in the office now, so when you visit it um, uh, uh, here at the Hagen um, History Center, you actually see these uh, uh, sheets of drawings that uh, Walter Medeiros uh, had produced when it was originally disassembled in uh, San Francisco. Well, let's see uh, so, uh, a couple more photos of the, uh, of the reconstruction uh, process as it was being um, uh, constructed. Uh, uh, in the view in the uh, lower uh, right there, you see that at this time, as the office was being um, reassembled and uh, constructed here, uh, at, uh, uh, at this time, 
you just looked out the windows into the rest of the uh, building. Remember, in, in the Pittsburgh installation, you looked out the windows into that corridor of the uh, Carnegie Museum. Here, you just looked out, and uh, as you can see on the, on the right there, into the rest of that building. But one new feature of this installation was that a photograph of the view of the buildings across Grant Avenue, which had been taken by uh, Pat Mahoney in 2016, was blown up and placed outside the windows. And um, here we see Jeff Kidder's rendering of this concept of his uh, for how you would actually uh, see, look, uh, give the impression that you're looking through the windows at the other side of, of, of Grant Avenue, so that you're actually there in, in San Francisco. And, uh, and here's, here's the result. Here's what it, what it looks like now. And, uh, and let me just show briefly again those views of the uh, completed installation that we, um, uh, that we saw earlier. Well, finally, let me say something about Wright's design for that bridge that he called the butterfly bridge, or sometimes he called it the butterfly wing bridge because of the, the shape of some of its uh, structural components. Wright began working on uh, this project in 1949 when he learned that there was a proposal for a new bridge from uh, San Francisco to the eastern side of the, uh, of the bay, and he built a, a large model of it. Uh, eventually, no bridge got built, and in any case, I think it's, it's unlikely that Wright's design would have been uh, accepted by the state agencies in charge of this because it was such a radical uh, concept, this bridge of, of rights, using uh, reinforced concrete in unusual ways uh, when nearly all bridges, um, at least in the US, were, were made of steel. And having such an unprecedented form, including a very uh, unusual feature, was that there was to be a suspended park at the top of the central span, which drivers could, move, uh, would, could pull off onto. Yeah, I think it's unclear just how practical this would have been. Um, but uh, that, this was uh, uh, part of this design of the, um, of the bridge. Well, the full story of this uh, design and Wright's promotion of it could be a whole separate uh, uh, talk. It's a fascinating story. The point I want to make here simply is that uh, this bridge design was closely associated uh, with the San Francisco office. The central part of the model was usually kept in the office, and Wright would uh, have press conferences there uh, promoting this uh, bridge design. And um, here at the bottom we see the, the entire uh, model on one of the occasions when it was exhibited elsewhere, but it was usually just the central part of it, because it, the, the, the uh, model was so large, it was uh, just the central part of it that was usually uh, at the uh, at the office. In fact, the, the the few photographs that show Wright in the office actually show him talking about uh, the bridge design and the model. And here we see um, uh, three of these, uh, three or four of these uh, uh, photos. One of them on the on the left there shows him uh, with the uh, rendering of the design, his uh, his um, a perspective drawing of the design and the other photos show him with the uh, model. According to the newspaper article that the, those photos were, uh, were in, he's describing with his hand gestures the unusual structure of the bridge and how well it would react to earthquakes. So it's very appropriate that the Hagen History Center currently has this model to display with the reconstructed office. I used to wish that the uh, model uh, could be brought back to San Francisco the way I used to wish that the office itself could be, but in both cases, Erie has beaten us to the punch. So I guess I just have to accept this graciously, for the fact is that the office and the model of the bridge no doubt belong together. So. My final thought has to be, as I said before, congratulations, Erie, Pennsylvania. <laughs>
Well, I believe now we're going to have a kind of question and answer period, and Jeff, I think you are going to moderate that. Yeah. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, uh, my name is Jeff Kidder, Kidder Architects here in Erie. And um, I've been involved with this project from the very beginning when Tom brought the idea to the History Center around 2016. So it's going on about seven years ago this started. And um, before, we get, before we get started with question and answer, because I know they're coming up, but I do, this was really a, a lot of people were involved with this project. I know my, my name was mentioned a lot, but. Um, I just was lucky to be a part of it. But I do want to give some credit to other people that were involved. Um, thank you, Paul, because his book, he has a whole chapter on it, and that was really kind of the first place to go to to learn about the office. He had done all the research, and it was really val invaluable. Um, I do want to thank George Deitch, who was director of the Hagen History Center. George is in the back there. He was um, director through this whole process from the beginning idea through to the opening. So um, thank you, George. Uh, Cal Pfeiffer, obviously, because now he's picking up where George left off and really running with the completed project. Uh, George was there through the, the hard part of making it a reality, and now Cal gets to reap the benefits of that. <laughs> um, the Erie County Historical Society board, uh, in particular, Mike Glass. Um, Mike is a board member, uh, retired from your insurance uh, construction department and just really was there through the whole process representing the, the board and organization and the staff and all the volunteers now that act as docents and give tours um, so the, for the visitor experience. Um, actu the actual kind of work of getting it together, I want to thank Kim Jeffries from Jeffries Engineering. Uh, Kim works in, a, in, we have share an office and Kim did all the mechanical um, electrical plumbing fire protection engineering, kind of the nuts and bolts. Mike Jeffries is my partner in um, Kidder Jeffries Construction. Mike managed the whole construction process um, with our superintendent, Tom Hinkler, which anybody that knows our team knows Tom very well. Um, and then in the Frank Lloyd Wright world, because really um, we kind of uh, kind of entered their world um, and they really didn't know who we were. so. It was a, a good experience um, getting to know those people. Um, Paul mentioned Pat Mahoney. He was Mike. He kind of handed the project off to me because he was in Buffalo and was the one going to do it. But I took over, so um, kind of Pat helped bring me up to speed. And as Paul said, he provided that photo, which we relied on heavily for the exhibit. Um, Pat told me when I first talked to him, I need to call Bill Schwartz. And luckily we have Bill here. <laughs> and um, so that was the beginning of my kind of um, relating and communicating with the people who actually knew the office firsthand. And Bill's been helping bounce, I've been able to bounce ideas and fill in, help fill in the blanks that were missing. And then Bill immediately said, I have to call Jan Novi. Uh, Jan Novi's an architect that Bill had worked with in the office. Jan started working for Aaron Green in the, I don't know, 65, 66, 64, and continued all the way through when Aaron passed away in 2001, Aaron left the practice to Jan. So Jan was responsible for kind of carrying on and eventually retiring and closing the office. Uh, Jan has just been a joy to get to know. I've been out to visit him twice. Um, he's also been the other person that's helped fill in the blanks he lived in the office and um, has donated items that we have on display that have really made it more than just uh, a pile of wood <laughs> and a very kind of cold space to put some life into it. Um, when I mentioned Frank Lloyd Wright world, there's a whole world of Frank Lloyd Wright people out there and, and organizations. And one is the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation, which owns and operates Taliesin and Taliesin West. They're kind of the, the keeper of the right um, spirit in, in world, and so they've welcomed us. Frank Lloyd Wright Building Conservancy, which is out of Chicago, um, they've welcomed us. All the people, a lot of people of all these organizations have been here and seen it, and have kind of given our, their stamp of approval, which is important for all of us involved. 
And then um, lastly, we have to thank Tom Hagen because we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him, um, his support, his vision, and... Um, <clears throat> And, you know, his foresight is, is working, and Cal has proven that with looking at visitation to the History Center is far and above what a regional kind of local-based historical society um, typically has, and it's all because of the office. So it took a lot of people to get here, and there's other people I'm forgetting, but I just have to thank everybody on that part. So question, questions? And maybe um, before, before we get to them, I'd like um, Bill, maybe, because you haven't, he hasn't seen it since 1988. And um, I was there when Jan Novi came to see it and was able to walk in with him for the first time. And yesterday, um, Bill and, and his wife, Tricia, who also knows the office well, because um, Bill worked there, um, and I was there when he walked in and it was just, it was great to be there when they see it for the first time. So maybe you just want to introduce yourself briefly and just a little quick background and then, you know, how, how was it <laughs> yesterday? The, the time that I spent working in this office in San Francisco was 60, 69 to uh, 88. And um, I was the first an employee of Aaron's uh, in 69, and within a, a, about three years, he, he wanted to turn his a, a, a attention more to his own independent practice, where I was working with him on, on the Marin County Civic Center and other, t a big Taliesin uh, pro uh, design project in San Jose. And um, Aaron wanted to do, he was, he was, developing his own independent practice and he wanted to exclusively put his attention on that and he asked me to leave with the, the right uh, associated projects in tow. He wanted me out of the office, he wanted to take all that, that material out and I did and I, I established an office separately. After a few years I kept coming back and we were working on things with Aaron and, and um, he, would, he, he would give me tips on what I was working on for, for Marin and so forth. I, I moved back into the office and with all that stuff too. Uh, so um, it, it was, a, it still is a, a, like a diamond to center my heart to, to, that, that, I, that I got to work in that wonderful place. The spirit was quite special. The culture was unlike most um, commercial operations. It, it was a, it was a heartfelt spirit of, of we're going to do something here that uh, Frank Lloyd Wright started and we want to fulfill his, his vision as broadly as we can and it's very exciting. Coming to see this yesterday after, I can't do the arithmetic since 1988, um, was uh, very surreal and wonderful and I tell you, Jeff and your, your exhibit designers and, and everyone who contributed to what we see there now did an exemplary job. It's fabulous. It, 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 really wonderful in every way. Every way. Yeah. Okay, and thank you. And just to give um, Bill credit, you've been continuing to um, consult Marin County on the ongoing preservation of I, I, I'm still, uh, I'm not a retired uh, architect yet. I, um, I do continue to work um, mostly in connection with the Marin County Civic Center on ongoing post-completion. How long has it been now? I still say post-completion. Well, it was completed in 1969, but <laughs> there's always something, you know, including accessibility, <laughs> ADA compliance and stuff like that, you know. I have a few other independent things. Okay, so we have several questions here. The first one is, um, did Mr. Green fund the cost of disassembling and creating the office? I, disassembling and creating the office when it was dismantled in 88, Mr. Green, Aaron Green, I, did he fund it? Or I think Monaghan paid for it. I don't it. know the answer. I don't know the answer to that yeah. specifically. I think I, it was probably part of the sale to Monaghan. It was probably part of, of, of the proceeds that he um, received from Monaghan that paid for that disassembly. Right. Yeah. Yes. Um, next question is, 
Did Wright's open space style building serve as a prototype for the open classroom concept in secondary schools in the 1970s? I don't know anything about school design in the 70s, but Paul? Yeah, I, I don't know the, exactly the answer to that as well, but I think uh, in, a, in a very general kind of way, it probably would just because Frank Lloyd Wright and his concept of if fluid spaces and these open spaces affected uh, uh, and influenced American architecture in so many ways that um, that is very likely that that would just be would have been a general kind of um, of influence of Frank Lloyd Wright on modern architecture in general that uh, then would uh, have been used or picked up by uh, 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 by school architects uh, for this open uh, classroom concept. So in a general way, I'd say yes. So, Would you agree? Yeah. Generally, yeah. He was influential generally, widely, yeah. yeah. Um, somewhat similar uh, related question. How would Frank Lloyd Wright define the term organic? And please give examples. So. Well, I, I know from hearing Aaron talk about this, who, who, who talk, spoke directly with Wright about this. By the way, I did not know Frank Lloyd Wright. I, I, I was a little late for that. I came on into this area effort in uh, 65. He died in 59. Aaron said that he, Wright told him, you know, I wish I had never used the word organic architecture because <laughs> it confuses people. And, and the word that he wanted to use if he could do it over again was bionic. He said, I would call it bionic or natural architecture. Just as hard to, to define probably. <laughs> um, it is an elusive, it always has been a little bit elusive um, but he didn't mean what's hanging in a, in a, in a butcher shop, he said. He, he, but, but organic in terms of relationships, relationships of one part of a thing to the other part of a thing, one part of a thing to the whole, whole the part, and so forth, so forth. There was a, there was a harmonious integration of, of things in, in terms of oh, what they looked like, how they felt, how they smelt, and, how, and, and what, was the, what was the inherent core uh, purpose of the undertaking, yeah. I think that what you just said about inner, I guess interconnected, interrelated is, even if you look at the office, it's a very, very simple, it's a very, very simple assembly of a few parts versus if you haven't been to Darren Martin House, which is much earlier, but that is extremely complicated and minutia detail at a much different scale, but if you kind of, they both have similarities in that there's really nothing that can be removed or added. Like every, every single piece has a reason and a purpose. There's nothing frivolous, there's nothing unnecessary, there's a reason for everything, and if you pull one, one piece out of it, it's gonna leave like a missing tooth. That's so, a characteristic of organic Yeah, and I think you can see that, that every, everywhere in, in all his designs, whether they were from 1900 or 1950, which is interesting that he was able to keep that general idea evolving over such a, a, a long period of time. Uh, the next question is, with today's pioneering design trend of biophilic design, which I don't even know what that is, um, is Wright's organic architecture ever compared to, the, to today's biophilic design principles. I have heard the word. Uh, Pat, you know the word? The answer? <laughs> we don't know the answer to the question. Yeah, and I'm afraid I can't really talk about it either. I'm sorry. Okay, I can't either, so. Um, maybe, the, 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 maybe the asker Who the asked question. the question? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Adam. Who asked that okay, question? Okay, Adam. <laughs> we won't get into it now. <laughs> Um, two more questions is, um, this is very specific, was any of the design for the Claremont Hotel Chapel done in the office? Claremont Hotel Chapel? Um, mm, let me think about it. I don't believe that it was executed. It was only a, a, a that's it, that's it. There it is. <laughs> oh, okay. This was, uh, this was not done in the office, no. no. I mean, just as not to say didn't pass through the office because Aaron would have been a, a re right. the representative who would have conveyed this and interacted with the client, yeah. but this was uh, this was done at Taliesin. Okay, and just so you, Taliesin wasn't a, necessarily a school; it was basically a working. 
it was, a, it was, it was a, commun a community uh, of, of people who gathered around Wright starting in 1932. We, we, he called it the Taliesin Fellowship, but it was a, a, it was an, a, a community of uh, future architects and dancers and poets and, and, and other artists in the allied arts, sculpture, everything. Yeah. Um, uh, the last question we have is related to the office, um, in, 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 you'll see. What have your thoughts on the preservation project of Wright's houses at Polymath Park in Acme, PA, near Falling Water? Current owners have turned these houses from other parts in the country into a vacation rental. So there's four houses, I think, at Polymath, four, and two of them are Wright houses that have been dismantled from other parts of the country and moved down near Falling Water, and, and then there's two Taliesin. By Peter Bernstein, uh, who were, they were built there on, on the site. They weren't moved there. Yeah. Okay. The two right houses that were moved there, one, one was a, a, a prefabricated house, and the other one was a built from the ground up house. Um, what do we think about it? Is that the question? Yes. That's, that's a touchy question. <laughs> oh, he's so, going to laugh from one person over there at least. I well, mean, I guess you know if... What about, Paul? Well, I, no, I don't, I don't think yeah. I really... Well, have the, man who, the man, I, I think he's done an admirable job. Papinchak is his name. Uh, and uh, I haven't personally visited these places. I think my friend Pat Mahoney has, but... He moved it. Yeah, from where? To Pennsylvania. And the second house came from where? Lindholm. Lindholm. Came Minnesota. Yeah. And what? Why were they in danger there, or did they just were for sale? No, they were threatened. With, they were threatened. They were threatened. <laughs> That's right, and a similar project was done in Oregon where they, they moved a, a house for, a, for, that was, a, was going to be demolished. They picked it up. Well, they didn't, they, they didn't pick up the masonry. They rebuilt the masonry and they picked up the rest. And very similar, yeah. Which one? And of course, we, so we have these Frank Electric houses still in existence. That's admirable. And these houses at Poly Polymath Park are rental. You can go and stay in them all, all four of them. So, so now the general public can actually get to experience firsthand. I have one last question. Um, when Aaron sold the office and, you know, was paid for it, what were, did he do with some of the money from the sale? I'm delighted to have this question. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright wasn't so celebrated and, and well known in the 50s and the 60s, and even when I went to school, and uh, I think Jeff, when you were in school, he was he was covered, but he wasn't. Uh, he didn't get the the attention and the glorification that we seem to like to give to him nowadays. This started in the 80s. There, uh, when I went to Talies, was it Talies in the in the 60s? I think there were a handful of Frank Lloyd Wright books, maybe five, and one of them might have been out of print. And um, we'll. In the 80s, there was, well, listen, in the 60s and 70s, essentially almost no archival effort at Taliesin. Bruce Brooks Pfeiffer uh, is the man who became the, uh, the archivist for the Frank Lloyd Wright collection. And he started to write 
uh, books about Wright and, and publish his, his drawings and so on and so forth. Uh, and and uh, Aaron Green was um, heartwarmed at this and he saw an opportunity to give a, a, a monetary support to the archives by selling the office and he did contribute at uh, first half of it to the Frank Lloyd Wright archives. And that, listen, if you know Frank Lloyd Wright, and you know that you go into a bookstore and there's 50 books, well, they're all written by, by Bruce, many of them were written by Bruce Pfeiffer, and he's responsible largely for what, 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 we, what we've seen uh, in terms of Wright's um, legacy come forward wide, widely and, and popularly, I think. So that's one point. And the other half uh, uh, was, Again, it was going, it's going to serve Italias, and it's, it's, uh, it's in, they're in trust right now, yeah. but they'll eventually, that, those funds will go to Italias and to support the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation's efforts. Um, although the archives are, are in, in New York now, there still is, at Italias and West, the archive building that, right, that Green's funding uh, 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 provided, and I think, according to Stuart Graff, uh, he told me that there there is a, a, a Xerox copy of every drawing in the, that that went to New York. So all of those drawings could be made available for researchers to study at Talias in the West. Yeah. Okay. So all, um, that's all the questions we have. I just want to uh, encourage everybody to visit the Hagen History Center if you haven't been there. Um, if you go to Buffalo, there's multiple. Um, sites there, some original right buildings and some reconstructed or never constructed but now constructed, and then go down to Falling Water and uh, Kentuck Knob and also Gray Cliff, which is between here and Buffalo, which is probably the closest one. And they're all just fabulous buildings. Um, there's a four day um, right great trail. What is it? Great Wright Trail, <laughs> which is a four a four day kind of start in Buffalo and work through Erie and down to Falling Water and visit these sites. And um, last summer, uh, architectural writer from Toronto did it, and we got to meet him here and show him the office. And he went to all he did the trail and wrote a nice two uh, I think two part article in the Toronto newspaper that promoted all the sites. So, you know. Everybody that has a, a publicly accessible site it wants to continue to increase visitation. So I encourage everybody, whether you're you know locally to sites or as you travel around the country, to make sure to to stop in and see these because um, they're really wonderful buildings. Um, I think that's it for tonight, and I just want to thank everybody for attending and thank Paul and Bill for helping out up here and um, look f look to the next um, lecture here. Thank you very much.